Welcome to the first video by WAF Logic, presented by the WAF guy himself. That's me. So today we're going to be diving into the world of web application firewalls, or WAFs for short. Yay, more acronyms. So I'd like to try to demystify what a WAF is and explore the, what I like to think is the fascinating life with WAF, or WAF life, as I like to call it. Now, you might be thinking, yay, another IT acronym. Hmm. Well, in this case, it's uh, true and relative because well, who wants to say web application firewall 20 plus times a day, Not let alone write it? I certainly don't. So what exactly is a WAF? Well, the simplest analogy I've come up with would be it's kind of like uh, your antivirus for your website. It's a poor analogy, but it helps break the ice with, you know, someone who knows nothing about what a WAF is. It, it detects uh, known threats using signatures much like an antivirus and, well, prevents it from causing harm or malicious uh, behavior. But here's the thing, you know, a WAF goes far beyond that, uh, just the basic antivirus analogy. Poor analogy again, but relative enough, and it kickstarts conversation. So at its core... Uh, a WAF focuses on inspecting web traffic and making binary decisions, you know, uh, allow or deny, ones or zeros. So when it comes to signatures, as our basic example for the moment and what all WAFs do, if a request sent to a web server matches one or more signatures, it will be denied, at least for the intended by design. Now, as said, this is just the basic function of any WAF. Most offer DOS and authentication, you know, brute force controls nowadays, as well as core functions, uh, among other features. And there are definitely more advanced techniques that we'll explore in future videos. But for today, we're just going to go and stick to the intro. You know, I wouldn't even call this the basics, kind of, but we're barely scratching the uh, tip of the iceberg here. So a WAF's core design is to protect against the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, which are the industry standard. Uh, practices and best practices are best to follow, and they all support this. Now, regulatory compliances like GDPR, GOBA, PCI, HIPAA, ISO 2701, etc., they all require WAF in blocking mode. So, not just the WAF, but in blocking mode as well. To the degree, uh, it's a different story for another day. Uh, requirements, you know, if your website allows user input or any kind of interaction for that matter, such as, you know, maybe comments, you have a blog. Uh, product inventory, you know, maybe you have some reviews for those products as well, or say you process any kind of monetary transactions, uh, credit cards, uh, even something as simple as gift cards, maybe sell them, maybe process them. Either way, a WAF is still required for anything that has interaction. Um, you know, why would you put your most valuable assets out there in something that's revenue generating without any protection? It just doesn't make sense. Now, WAFs might seem complex, but you need complexity to outsmart essentially the hackers that are using these complex attacks and complex methods to steal your revenue and your information. One of the top two most common ways companies have been breached is really via their public facing web applications. Emails right alongside with that, they're the top two, but nonetheless, we're talking WAF today. The reality is with the right skill sets though, and experience, and certainly the technology, WAF life is actually very manageable at any scale. You know, I've dealt with thousands of policies and lived in the WAF life for as long as I have. This is easy peasy stuff for me at this point, and it's more like play than work. Uh, and I'm sure most folks that have been in this industry uh, working with this as long as I have would pretty much agree, but don't tell our employers that just because the beatings just increase if morale rises. They don't decrease, unlike my, what you might have been told, I assure you. <laughs> now, you, you might wonder where a WAF should be placed in your infrastructure. Well, it must sit in line in the flow of traffic in order to function correctly, since that is the only way it can mitigate detected threats. It can't mitigate threats when it's sitting on the sidelines, uh, just sitting there monitoring, like an IPS on the stick or whatever on a stick which is about as useful as a stick in the mud. Um, not useful at all. So some might say, well, we want to install a WAF, but we don't want it to block our traffic. Well, you don't have to worry about that at all, because uh, just like any security product, uh, WAF has a transparent or evaluation mode. You know, same meaning, just different words for different vendors, whatever. Um, they all want to be unique. 
So with the transparent or evaluation mode, it provides you the insight into what the WAF detects and advises you on what actions it would have taken without actually taking any action at all. So kind of like the stick method earlier, but in this case, it's actually inline. So, you know, it can actually block in case you need to, in case the building's on fire versus on the side, fleet network or reinfrastructure redesign, and the fire has already burned down your building, so it's too late. So with the, this method, you can go ahead and evaluate the product. Uh, you can configure it as necessary, and you can tune to your specific needs relative to your environments. And most importantly, you get to design it at a pace that's comfortable for you and your organization's needs and goals. Now, let's address the, the misconception of having multiple WAFs. You might've seen this. Uh, you might think it's redundant and not cost efficient, or at least you've probably heard that. But for the most part, that's actually not true. Uh, there's a lot more to this story. So in the world of security, the, the only analogy always holds true and is always relative. It'll never go out of style. Having multiple WAFs in an organization is uh, quite common, and especially when you have something like a CDN like Akamai and an on-premise uh, and or cloud infrastructure. And yes, okay, another acronym, sorry. Uh, CDN, Content Delivery Network, it's basically just a glorified image caching, um, but it's not basically just that, just for simplicity for the conversation. Much more awesome sauce going there, but either way. Moving on. So for our example, Akamai, they, they handle the front end, the heavy, the heavy load. They're taking care of the basic attacks, uh, cross-site scripting attempts, uh, you know, vulnerability scans, and other low-level threats while they handle all the heavy workload as a CDN as well. Now, by doing so, you save on the cost since you only pay for the request that Akamai actually proxies to your organization. You also don't pay for that traffic transact and transactional resources at your ingress pipe or ISP. Um, not at the network server infrastructure. Those resources are uh, free. And also potentially your hosting provider or cloud provider, if you have that, and you absolutely do pay for every one of those transactions. Bottom line, uh, an organization pays for every one of these uh, requests to some measurable degree. Thus, if it didn't happen, you didn't have to pay for it. So... Akamai's Kona WAP, for our example today, uh, a modified version of Apache Mod Security. So open source, a uh, very generic platform, um, but caters very specifically to OWASP. And it serves as a security generalist, but heavy lifter solution. So they can take out those billions of scanner events, which every company gets every single day, and it's a large majority of some traffic. You don't pay for that on any of your infrastructure behind Akamai, and even at Akamai, because they dropped it, so you didn't pay for it. Now, on the other hand, Reg F5, you know, my favorite company, or, you know, we'll just say uh, Edge WAP in general, being they tend to be uh, more advanced and robust, and they tend to give you greater control and much more granular and instant changes. Um, unlike, say, Akamai or other CDN and SaaS providers, security is a solution, uh, they, they tend to have a several minute delay, sometimes 15 minutes tends to be pretty common, till changes actually truly take effect globally. Now, this can hurt you if you have, say, an outage and you're pushing a fix and you have to wait now 15 minutes for that to be pushed uh, globally for it to actually take effect, uh, even though you made the change versus, say, an on-prem, when you make a change, it happens instantly. Let me tell you, that'll be one of the most painful progress bars you'll ever watch. But th this gives reason to leverage more advanced, um, but potentially more dangerous techniques like, you know, SQL mitigation, uh, even despite the fact that those features are likely available at the CDN uh, WAF layer, albeit lesser quality signatures, but which further justifies this, but leave it to the on-prem solution that, that the organization fully controls. And like all CDNs, you don't have full control as is anyways. Now, on-prem WAFs, air quotes, because clouds got, has to be considered, they, they allow you to leverage uh, you know, more advanced WAF techniques like length and character limitations, um, character input, uh, regular expression-based controls, SQL injection, as we said earlier, and just other command injection mitigations, um, flow controls, and, you know, potentially even self-coded solutions such as iRules with the F5, again, favorite company. Uh, but if, in this case, like if the feature doesn't even exist, well, you could build it yourself on the WAF and then boom, you got yourself a solution. 
So e each product, in the end, they, they have different degrees of detection and mitigation controls, varying advanced features, et cetera. You know, not, not all are equal, but in general, our on-prem, air quotes, uh, WAPs tend to have more capabilities than the CDNs. And that actually is a very good thing. Um, it's a deeper conversation for a whole other video another day, but for the sake of moving on here. So each has their place and their ups and downs and their caveats. Regardless, the, the key point is having that onion layered approach is keen for security. Now, why stop there? More onion layers, yes. You can add a host-based WAF such as Nginx uh, on your web servers in line with the, with the CDN and the Edge WAF uh, protections. So this provides yet another layer of protection that adds even more value from security to monetary. Now, remember, the best protection is the one closest to the resources that needs to be protected. By having a WAF on the web server at the application layer, uh, you eliminate the risk of unmitigated attacks originating from compromised internal systems, which generally bypass the WAF layer by design. You know, historically, the internal systems have been blindly trusted because, well, no one can get in. Yeah, right. Uh, and historically, more so recently, for that matter, uh, that has been proven to be a very, very poor choice of judgment. And unfortunately, many of us have made that mistake. We've been there, too. Um, so with the host base WAFs, your security visibility really is just further enhanced with full coverage of all potential layers for web-based threats. Now, okay, for honesty, don't, don't think too deep on that statement there. OS security is usually someone else's job, and hopefully all the other security folks are doing their jobs uh, effectively too. And for that matter, today we're talking about the basics or really the intro, as I kind of said. So but this also closed the gap with insider threats and the zero trust models in the WAF license, for that matter. Um, the, the zero trust model is becoming very popular, and it's very necessary for that matter. It's being worked into regulations uh, as well. So this further... Uh, justifies, you know, having a host-based WAF security solution, which might, again, become mandatory. And why not, you know, be ahead of the curve, be ahead of the game, and protect yet another layer that you can because the technology exists. So a host-based WAF, unfortunately, does not replace the edge and beyond base WAFs. Would be nice, but no. In tandem, though, as they work together collectively, they all are actually very complementary to each other. And with every layer protected, you have maximum comprehensive security uh, for your web. Now, just like you need a router at each layer, which requires a network firewall at each layer and an IPS at each layer, it simply makes sense. When the majority of transactions these days are web app related in layer seven to have equal coverage with your WAF and general security stack as well, you know, one-to-one, -one. why have an odd ratio? So, when will we be done tuning those WAF policies? That's a great question though. And uh, honestly, uh, yes, I do know, uh, I get to ask this very often. The truth is it's an ongoing process. Uh, it'll never stop. As long as AppDev keeps developing web apps and potentially punching holes in our ship, there will always be new challenges for us to address. And so that means that whether we like it or not, we will always need to continuously improve and refine our WAF policies. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. Yay, cliches. But hey, it works, and at least it's relative. So that's a wrap for our first video on understanding what a WAF is and its core basics. Go ahead and join us uh, in our upcoming videos where we, we're going to be taking a deeper dive down this rabbit hole of the awesome sauce of the world of WAF life. Our, our future videos will be including uh, more real configurations, uh, real events, uh, and much more hands-on things that you can, you know, reproduce yourself at home as well and follow along. And hopefully, you know, just more entertaining content. So with all that said, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Stay safe and stay secure.